give you a little overview of my visit. I had an opportunity to uh, visit Chattanooga, and I had as my hosts and guide uh, Jed Marston from the Chattanooga Chamber of Commerce. Jed, you just want to uh, identify yourself and uh, thank you very much for taking me around. And of course, Ken Hayes from Kinsey Probasco Hayes. Uh, they were my, uh, my guides and um, my supporters during the visit. Well, you know, I told them when I arrived at the airport that I came out of the gate and I wasn't uh, received by a human being at that time. It was actually a kiosk. And that kiosk was very, uh, quite brilliantly uh, stated that Chag Chattanooga is a city that is a can-do community. And it dawned on me uh, at that moment that, you know, I'm going to be hearing about that all the way through. And you know what? That's really what that community was all about, all the way through. It's a can-do community that, that uh, developed confidence and its ability to transform that community in a very short period of time. And let me explain why. Uh, Chattanooga is a community that uh, back in uh, the uh, early part of the, or the later part of the 20th century, I should say, uh, it was a very prosperous town. And it's very comfortable uh, as a result of smokestack industries, really. Uh, it was heavy industry that, that brought a lot of wealth to that community. But um, the U.S. government, and particularly a fellow by the name of Walter Cronkite on the U.S. Nightly News, pointed out the fact that Chattanooga, while it was prosperous and wealthy and very comfortable, it also had the dirtiest air in North America. And as a result of that, the people in Chattanooga took note and uh, decided that they were going to clean the air. They had to. They couldn't see in front of themselves. Uh, they told me that they always had to change their shirt two or three times a day just to, just to deal with life as it was in, uh, in Chattanooga. So what they did was they started a process of this can-do attitude of transforming their community. Uh, they had a process of uh, civic envisaging. Is that how you say it? I think so. In any event, it was a local collaboration, a very intense local co collaboration, and they imagined what life could be in a clean air environment. And as a result of their $10 million investment by the civic and company uh, engagement, uh, they were able to create a very clean environment. And today, it in fact is a, um, a process that has been uh, modeled by, uh, by other communities uh, in the United States. And from that, from that imagined environment, they then went to the next level and imagine what their waterfront and their downtown could be like. And for those of you who've been to their riverfront, it is truly transformed. From that, they also looked at, well, what can we do with the economy? And with the, um, uh, the community, they decided that they were going to have a community-wide gigabyte environment. They worked with the um, Electric Power Board, and we have n members of that uh, group here today. And they imagined what a community that could be connected through a smart grid to 170,000 residences and businesses. And they imagined that, and that's what they did. And as a result of that, today, they have a community where I sat and listened to many SMEs and students talk about staying in their community. Well, we, we talk a lot about talent attraction, but when you really look at it, it's about talent retention the end of the day. You've got a lot of students in universities and they have feet and they'll leave. But if you can keep them, if you can retain them, that in fact is success in a community. And what they told me was, you know, here's a community that has a can-do attitude. Here's a community that took these, ch these, these challenges and made something of them. And uh, they liked that. They, uh, in fact, uh, said, why would we want to move anywhere else? We have a gigabyte environment that doesn't exist anywhere else in North America. Uh, we have a wonderful downtown and waterfront that uh, has been transformed, and we have a great community that is very welcoming. So as a result of that, they have, in fact, been able to uh, retain quite a lot of SMEs and talent coming out of their, uh, uh, their, their uh, universities. But they've also been able to attract uh, healthcare and research organizations such as the Sim Center from Atlanta and other groups like that. They've also been able to attract a lot of new businesses such as Volkswagen, Amazon.com, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and many other companies uh, to their region. 
So uh, what I'd like to do is ask that the video be turned on and you'll see what a can-do community is all about. Welcome to Chattanooga, Tennessee, a place so beautiful it inspired a community quest to make it the best mid-sized city in America. Chattanooga is nestled in a bend of the Tennessee River and surrounded by mountains and lakes, so Chattanoogans enjoy abundant outdoor views and adventures. But our city is much more than a pretty playground. Recently, Chattanooga astonished the country when the New York Times hailed the community for deploying America's fastest internet. Every home and business in a 600 square mile area can access up to one gig per second data rates. That's 200 times faster than the fastest broadband available in most other places. And now, EPB, Chattanooga's electric utility, is using its network as the backbone for the nation's most advanced smart grid. That's just one example of Chattanooga's can-do spirit, which has grown a strong and diverse local economy while attracting more than $4 billion in foreign direct investment in recent years. Chattanooga is the new home of Volkswagen's only U.S. assembly operation, and many other manufacturers have major facilities here, including Komatsu, Aztec, and Miller Industries. The Tennessee Valley Authority's Power Control Headquarters, which is located in downtown Chattanooga, serves as the hub for an extremely strong energy sector. Alstom recently completed a $280 million facility to make the world's largest power generation turbines. Westinghouse has established a major training facility here. And neighboring Bradley County recently attracted Volker Chemi, which is investing $1.5 billion to establish a facility for the production of solar chemicals. The city is also the headquarters for insurance companies like Unum and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Chattanooga sits in the upper part of the southeastern United States with many major cities nearby. Our companies benefit from a strategic location with outstanding transportation and shipping capabilities. Interstates 24, 75 and 59 intersect here. And Chattanooga's river port accesses nearly 16,000 miles of navigable waterways. The city is also a major railway hub with excellent connections to competing freight carriers. In addition, Chattanooga provides access to outstanding educational institutions and world-class research facilities. Ten local colleges and universities deliver advanced preparation, including a nationally recognized training program in robotics and automated controls. The University of Tennessee at Chattanooga is the home of the Sim Center National Center for Computational Engineering a unique research facility that uses computer simulations to solve real-world engineering problems. For example, the Sim Center identified inexpensive ways to improve the fuel efficiency of big rig trucks by more than 8%. A private company is commercializing the results. Chattanooga also benefits from a strong partnership with nearby Oak Ridge National Laboratories, which receives about $1.2 billion in national funding and specializes in many research areas that private companies can license or use to improve their products. Oak Ridge's research specialties include energy, advanced materials, and supercomputing. Chattanooga has tremendous business assets, but there's something else that sets the community apart. In 1969, the federal government declared Chattanooga the dirtiest city in the United States. Community leaders and business people responded by pioneering a cooperative process to clean up the environment while balancing economic needs. By 1974, the federal government recognized Chattanooga for meeting all national air quality standards. Since then, Chattanoogans have utilized that same can-do community spirit to transform our riverfront with public green spaces and launch a fleet of downtown electric shuttles that carries a million riders each year. In fact, Chattanooga has been named one of the best places to live in America by both National Geographic and Outside Magazine. Our dual commitment to the environment and revitalization has created one of the most engaging lifestyles you'll find anywhere. Chattanooga is a mecca for outdoor recreation. A mild climate with four distinct seasons and vivid fall colors will entice you to go out and play year-round. When you've had enough sun, shop until you drop at Tennessee's largest mall or explore the city's artsy boutique shopping districts. Chattanooga has also won national acclaim for the excellence of the health care provided at 10 area hospitals. Chattanooga offers all this at a surprisingly affordable cost of living. Average housing prices are 15% below the national average, 
and values are climbing steadily. Chattanooga combines the convenience and warmth of a mid-sized city with metropolitan amenities. Add to that the cooperative can-do spirit and the commitment to the environment that underlies everything we do, and you start to understand what it means to live the good life Chattanooga style. Well, Mayor, you're also an urban planner. That's right, yeah. So your involvement with uh, this imagining process and the conversion and transformation of your waterfront and cleaning the air in, in Chattanooga, you've been involved with it from pretty much the beginning. I saw your name all over the book I read. Now. Well, uh, yeah, I, I have had the privilege of being able to, to work through Chattanooga's past and bring it up to the present time as a city planner. In fact, the, the thing we don't talk about all that much simply because air gets the most attention. Our water was pretty polluted too way back then. And uh, of course now with our riverfront and all, we're glad that we've cleaned up that act as well. But Chattanooga was a very different city. It, it was an old industrial city. As I said yesterday in our gathering, something of an anomaly in the southern United States because most cities sort of had an agricultural background. Chattanooga's was industrial. And so uh, with the industrial age, we prospered. With the decline of the industrial age, we declined. And uh, now we're redeemed and transformed. And I truly believe, being a city planner and having had the opportunity to go pretty much all over the country and to a great extent all over the world, that Chattanooga is perhaps the most transformed city in America. Do you want to talk a little bit about the transformation and the kind of elements that uh, took place since about 1992? The things that have happened since 92, well actually I have to go back a little further than that to the mid 80s because uh, the, the dirtiest city in America uh, was the, that, um, that title being granted to us by Walter Cronkite was a big wake up call. And as we cleaned up our air, we still really didn't transform our economy to the degree that we should. In the 1980s we went through another economic decline one of those things, some of those cycles that we experience worldwide from time to time. And we found that our old industries were failing us. So we gathered people together and uh, we asked the public because old industrial cities, and in fact cities all over, seem to have this attitude that there's some power structure that's controlling everything. Well, if that was ever true in Chattanooga, it wasn't by mid-1980s, the power structure was gone or or uh, if it ever existed to the degree that people thought it did. So we called the public together and challenged them to come up with ideas with, uh, and we challenged them to be audacious. I love that word, you know, to, to think up things with audacity. And uh, we invited a, a long list of speakers to town. We took people from Chattanooga to other cities to be inspired. We visited Baltimore, which was emerging from its own decline at that time in Boston and many other cities including local cities like Birmingham and Charlotte and so forth and uh, the people came up with ideas one being an aquarium which sounds like not a very audacious idea now but back then there were only a couple in the country and the idea of having an inland aquarium on the Tennessee River was uh, was a pretty big big idea and so the community worked through that. We had a lot of other ideas too that just had to do with social services and things that don't get a lot of attention. But we found that the magic was engaging the public because then the public had ownership in it and felt that they had a responsibility to help make it happen. And even though when people say, oh, great that Chattanooga did this, everyone working together, every community has naysayers. But if you have a base of the population that's participated in putting together a work program as we did in Chattanooga, you're much more likely to see it succeed because people own it, they feel uh, that it is their responsibility and you can work through the naysayers. Well, there was a tremendous engagement there and, and I, I arrived and I was at, invited to an event uh, Sunday evening, uh, but I could see that the entire community was represented there, not just people from uh, uh, some of the kind of SME incubator types, uh, people who are interested in, in developing businesses, but there were so many others who were there to be supportive. 
That's, that's the great thing. When we first started the visioning process back in the 1980s, it, people had a hard time believing that if they showed up, they would be listened to. So we, we went to great pains. I mean, those processes now that have become commonplace that we sort of pioneered back then, the visioning process, the nominal group process, and we made sure that when someone made a suggestion that we wrote it down in their own words, grammatical errors and everything else, so that when we then published, as we did regularly, I mean, we, we wore out a, a copying machine, uh, the effects of, of that visioning process that people saw that we had not changed their words. And that turned out to be very important because at the end, when we were reviewing the process, several people mentioned that, that they were pleased that in the process of uh, facilitating that the thoughts and the process of uh, putting it on paper was pure. It was a purity to it. We call it transparency now. We've got a lot of new terms for what we accomplished. But it is great. Now, uh, then if we could get 50 to 75 people to a gathering, we th figured it was a success. So we had multiple gatherings. Now, if we talk about the future in Chattanooga, we get 200, 700, 800 people who come and fill up a hall like this, and everyone gets involved. Well, there's still there's a new group, uh, Chattanooga Stand. Can you talk right. about them? Or? Well, that's been the most successful effort, and that's, that's a group of young people who came through Leadership Chattanooga, which is something that we started back then in the 1980s, to train people who are interested in leadership just what the, the variant uh, uh, necessary components of a community are. And they were uh, enamored with the vision process. A lot of them were too young to have participated in it way back then. They were toddlers even if they were even born. And so they wanted to do something new and something involving technology, which of course has changed a lot since the mid-1980s. And so they went through a computer-based process of doing something like Chattanooga Venture and Vision 2000 from the mid-80s and got over 25,000 people participating. It's the largest Fantastic. engagement of the public that, that we know of anywhere, one of those Guinness Book of World Records things that we think will stand for a while. Well, engagement's a real theme in your community, and, and uh, enabling that engagement is, uh, is, is interesting, but that enablement also requires something very special, and what you're building there is uh, the smart grid. Right. And you have uh, the electric power board that you know, I, I had a, a, a good opportunity to have a conversation with that really understands the needs of the community. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, the smart grid, uh, first of all, we started back uh, in the early 2000s. We, we wanted to embark on something that involved technology. And so we attempted something called MetroNet which employed some of the fiber that, that had been installed at that time. Uh, Chattanooga, again, as I mentioned yesterday, being a railhead, we had a lot of fiber that was laid in the 70s and early 80s that came through the city. And then some that kind of circled the downtown area that the power board, a municipally owned utility, had installed for their own control purposes. And so we attempted to use that to tie some businesses in and with some borrowed equipment and things of that nature. And it was really a little ahead of its time. So as things uh, developed in technology and as prices came down for the use of, of fiber and technology and so forth, the Power Board came back to the idea of controlling their whole system, which is a, a, a large system, about 600 square miles, 170-something thousand users by extending fiber to every home and every business. That's 170,000 of them. That is an audacious idea. <laughs> I, I love that. That's bigger than the aquarium was in the yeah. 1980s. And uh, they proceeded to do a business plan. The Power Board, even though it's municipally owned, it's not a corporation, but it has a board of directors that is the most interesting group that I know of and one of the most powerful boards in our area. Some of our best business people, and we've very carefully selected them. I get to appoint the board, the, the city council confirms them. And so we picked some of our best business minds from the full spectrum of the political spectrum in Chattanooga and the United States. Liberal Democrat, conservative Republican, uh, and people all in between. Board of five. 
And they blessed this plan after they, they went through a lengthy process of developing the plan for the business and embarked on borrowing the money and uh, issuing bonds and so forth. It's over a $300 million investment. And then an interesting thing happened. Uh, when the economy turned down, and of course the, uh, the stimulus programs were announced, they were looking for shovel-ready projects. Well, Chattanooga was already shoveling on this project. <laughs> we were already extending fiber. And uh, so we qualified and received a $111 million grant to build it out Fantastic. faster and to make sure that the underserved areas of cities that, that occur everywhere were served first. And so we did that. And uh, it is intended to manage this very complex system, but you can piggyback on that, all of these other services. Video, which everyone, everyone loves that, and uh, very powerful. You know, you high definition televisions and all that require more than just the old, old rusty copper wires of the past. So it's state of the art. Telephone, data, the fastest internet service in the United States. And when I say that to people, I always say, first I have to ask you to suspend disbelief. And they say, Chattanooga? Yeah. Uh, New York, uh, a couple of reporters were interviewing me early one morning and they said, if you want the fastest internet service, you might think you have to go to Southern California or to the Boston area. But no, it's a little town, they said, down south. And so I had, to, I had to comment on that. I said, we're not a little town except by New York standards or something of that nature. We're mid-sized. But we are, for now, uh, the home of the fastest internet service in the country. So just staying on the infrastructure discussion, uh, that has helped you to attract a lot of new business to the area. Anything like that. And in fact, the quality of life issues, anything that, you, that gets a community on the short list. Back in the 80s, we would talk about being on the short list of progressive communities. And uh, the more of those lists that you appear on, you've got to have an impact on people's consciousness out there. And people are always searching around for another place to invest, another place to go. And we have gone so far in Chattanooga now that from our dirty past, we now have people choosing to live in Chattanooga simply because of the quality of life. And that brings the attention of investors and uh, both Volkswagen and Alston admitted when they were making their announcements that it was not the financial incentives which every community provides because they were pretty much balanced, but it was quality of life factors that brought them to Chattanooga. So uh, with quality of life and with tremendous infrastructure, uh, you've been able to grow a knowledge workforce. Yes. Um, and you've been able to retain that knowledge workforce. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Again, I think a community, uh, it's going to be a great community. You need to have a great university. And we had uh, a division of the University of Tennessee. It was formerly University of Chattanooga, and it, it was taken into the university system few decades back, and uh, it was always attempting to find itself, its role in, in the university structure. Well, and then they attracted the Sim Center, which the film noted, uh, some of the most powerful minds in technology and computational physics, and, and began to train people for master's and doctor's degrees. And uh, of course, that, that begs the need for connection with other universities. And some of that fiber that was laid along railroad lines connected us directly to Oak Ridge and to Georgia Tech and to Huntsville. And so we have students coming from all over uh, with no fear that they, that they will not be able to practice their role in life in Chattanooga, in that little town down south, because we have uh, the ability not only for them to begin their career, but for them to advance in their career. And that brings the kinds of minds and retains the kinds of minds. We were losing our youth back in the 70s and 80s. They were growing up saying, let me out of here. And now I'm proud to hear from those young people when they come back that they tried it outside and they really couldn't find a better place than Chattanooga. I have a couple of other questions, but I'd like to just scan the audience. If there's anybody here who has a burning question, please raise your hand, and I'll make sure that uh, you have the opportunity to ask. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. As there are commercial providers in uh, your area, what, what penetration rate are you getting on your, on your services? 
We actually are getting great penetration rate. Now, the commercial providers are not doing the same thing, except for if you're talking about video services and so forth. But uh, again, our system was built with the idea and on the business plan that it would manage the electrical system, and it can do that on, on those revenue savings alone. But we're up to, I think, about 20 percent already, and uh, they've only been at this for a few months. They were signing people up at the rate of about 110 a day the last time I checked. And uh, we now have competition in the market, which we didn't have before. The other providers in the area have improved their service, and God bless America, we love the fact that competition makes things better. The other thing is the EPB services are not offered on the basis of lower cost. Their costs are actually a little higher than the competitors. And uh, it's that way for a reason, because we don't want to be accused of unfairly taking advantage of the fact that it's a government-sponsored entity. But even with that, the quality of the service is attracting people, and the fact that it's a complete package that gives them access to practically internet speed, any internet speed that they could want or use. Are there any other questions? Uh I have a question very quickly. Uh, one of the wow factors in your community was a time when you introduced me to your police chief. And uh, you know, not only little helicopters flying around in the room, but uh, there was a three-dimensional uh, demonstration that you gave. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's not really my question. I mean, I was wowed by all of that. It's the innovation that was taking place, not only in the private sector, but in the public sector, I was really wowed by that. Do you have any other examples? Well, I could get Mark Keel to come up and give you a rundown of his 485 applications that he scrolled through hurriedly yesterday. Yeah. But we do believe that, that, uh, that digital technology, and particularly fiber, is exactly uh, the kind of infrastructure that, that makes cities progress. I mean, Chattanooga was on a river for a purpose because they were doing business on a river. Then the railroads came through and we were doing business on the railroads, and then the highways and the interstates, and now the infrastructure of the current and, and foreseeable future is fiber. And uh, we fortunately have that, and that is sparking innovation. I, I cannot imagine where it's going. People say to me, you're a city planner, where's all this going? And I, 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 the thing that excites me about it is I know that it's something really like discovering a new element or, a new, mm. or something that uh, has some practical applications like fire or electricity, but it has a lot of applications that bright minds out there are thinking up right now, and Chattanooga will attract those bright minds. Well, I know you had a lot of eureka moments probably, but uh, one of the areas that uh, theme of healthcare, for instance, uh, you have some significant uh, healthcare companies and hospitals in your region. Yeah. Can you just talk about that? Unum, which is one of the largest uh, disability insurers in the country, headquartered in Chattanooga, met with me and some of the county officials several years ago and said, what we really need is for our workers to be able to work from home. This was before the power board started extending their reach. And they said they need, in order to do that, they need powerful computers. And, and we can provide the computers, but they need connections to those computers. So that met a specific need by a very large company, Blue Cross Blue Shield, consolidated all of their operations in Chattanooga. They had some in Memphis and others scattered around. And the ability to, uh, to connect with doctors and health providers through the network that we have is a major factor there. Now, uh, listening to all your discussing here about health care, the city of Chattanooga has done one other thing which hasn't been discussed. The city provides primary health care to all of its employees and their dependents. We have our own clinic, we have our own pharmacy, and we are creating a medical home where their records will be kept. And so we're advanced even in a small way, just by virtue of a city government. And when I talk to other mayors and uh, gatherings at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, that's a wow factor as well. It's, uh, it's utilizing technology for the benefit not just of, of the city and as, as a whole, but it benefits our employees, which we think benefits the city as a whole. Fantastic. Uh, before we conclude, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Yeah, Rob McDonald from Geelong. Um, the question I have is just relating to 
the competition versus the EPB systems? Is it a separate network that they use or is it open access where they can use your fibre? I'm just trying to understand just how the relationship between infrastructure and retailer comes in. Well, our, our system, because it is a system that is tied to the management of the electrical system, is separate. And there have, of course, we have, we have basic infrastructure, poles and ways of carrying infrastructure that are utilized by all of the competitors, both the copper wire and the coaxial cable and the fiber optics. And, and some of those uh, other suppliers, competitors, have fiber optics as well, but not as extensive as ours. Again, because we need it to go all the way to the meter base at every home and every, every business customer. Now, I'd like to take other questions, but we are on a time limit here. So uh, if you have a question, please take it out to the networking that we're going to have uh, after this. So I'd like to just thank you, uh, Mayor, and uh, also to the citizens, to Jed, who uh, helped me get around town. And uh, the Chamber of Commerce, by the way, is doing a fantastic job for you in economic development, I have to tell you that. Absolutely. We have some others scattered around the audience here. Right. Joe Ferguson, who is the chair of the Electric Power Board, and Wayne Kropp, who heads our Enterprise Center, who will be here for the networking. So Thanks. please, uh, we're going to spend some time. Uh, we'll call you back in in about 15, 20 minutes, but uh, take a, a break, and uh, let's, uh, let's get back together for the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.